Hello and welcome to the UC Davis Energy Exchange webinar series. Today's webinar topic is Building Leakage Diagnostics with IoT-Enabled Sensor Networks. Our speakers for today are Mark Madera, Director at the Western Cooling Efficiency Center, and Armando Casillas, Senior Scientific Engineering Associate at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. My name is Paul Fortunato, the Creative Specialist for the Energy and Efficiency Institute, and your host of today's webinar. The research presented today would not be possible without the generous contributions from our sponsors, XCSpec, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, and the DOD's Environmental Security Technology Certification Program. Thank you for supporting our energy efficiency research. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. Everyone who has joined the webinar is currently muted and is in listen-only mode. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your control panel. I'll bring them up during the presentation, and we will also have 15 minutes for questions at the end. I'll also provide a contact slide at the end of this webinar so that you may quickly get in touch with us. This webinar is being recorded, and a copy will be sent to each of you. These webinars are a service provided by the collaborative efforts of the Energy and Efficiency Institute, the Western Cooling Efficiency Center, California Lighting Technology Center, and the Center for Water Energy Efficiency. These webinars would not be possible without the continued support of all of our affiliate partners. We wanna thank you for supporting these efforts. We encourage you to stay in touch by joining our mailing list and following us on Twitter and YouTube. We publish a monthly newsletter. These, these newsletters offer a current glimpse into the research events and notable happenings at each of the UC Davis Energy Research Centers. If you have not yet signed up for our newsletter, you can follow the link on the screen or send me a message with your email address in the question box and I will get you registered. Today's topic once again is building leakage diagnostics with IoT enabled sensor networks. And now I would like to welcome Mark Madera. Mark, I'm going to pass this off to you now. Okay. Uh, can you hear me, Paul? Yes, we hear you just fine. Okay, good. Um, well, hello, everybody. Um, we're going to talk a bit today uh, about duct leakage and building leakage, not what it does, uh, but rather how would you detect it and determine it in a non-intrusive way. A um, little bit of background. So uncontrolled airflows in buildings basically has been a problem for a long time, and it's not going away, unfortunately. Um, We'll start with build, leakage in the building envelope. Uh, one of the issues with that is it defeats our desire to thermally condition and filter ventilation air. In other words, if you have air coming through leaks, you don't know where it's coming from. Uh, you don't have any control over it. You can't either filter it or, uh, or condition it. Um, and particularly in commercial buildings, it creates off-design loads. So commercial buildings are supposed to be run pressurized. If they're not being run pressurized, then what happens is you wind up with zones that were not actually part of the design for the building, because those are not included. Um, and then, of course, it wastes energy due to conditioning of that infiltrating air that cannot be counted for ventilation. In other words, in a commercial building, you can't say, well, I've got a bunch of leaks in my building, and therefore that's providing the ventilation. That just it's not allowed, and not a good way to do it anyway. Switching over to duct leakage, uh, the issues with duct leakage is in a large building. So in houses, like commercial buildings, the issue is you lose thermal energy to unconditioned spaces. However, in larger buildings, more of the energy loss is due to increased fan power required to move uh, the undelivered air. If the ducts do go through unconditioned spaces, which happens in like commercial buildings, and of course in attics and houses, uh, then you waste thermal energy. And then finally, with duct leakage, it reduces your ability to control building pressures and flows. Basically, flows start going places where they're not supposed to go. So what are the energy impacts? Uh, 
there was envelope leakage. There's not been a lot of work, honestly, on envelope leakage in commercial buildings. There's been a lot of work on houses, not very much on commercial buildings. Uh, there's a NIST uh, study that explains up to 36% uh, projects, up to 36% HVAC energy savings in heating dominated areas. They focused on heating dominated. Um, interestingly, in cooling, cooling areas, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, on duct leakage, um, I've spent a good fraction of my career worrying about duct leakage, uh, but I'm not quoting me on any of this. Um, this is a DOE study, as well as there's a paper uh, by Craig Gray at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab uh, that explains a 30, comes up with a 20% duct leakage increase that, excuse me, that 20% duct leakage increases fan power by 50%. And that's been published many, many times. Um, I don't want to dwell on all this. The purpose today is not to say, or talk all about the implications, but rather, how do you go and find it? So the conventional test methods for finding leakage, either envelope leakage or duct leakage, is typically to use something called fan pressurization. Um, at its simplest level, fan pressurization involves turning on a calibrated fan measuring the flow through that fan, measuring the pressure difference either across the duct or across the envelope that that fan flow produces and using that as a way to calculate the leakage of the building. Uh, the one thing in this picture uh, and the picture on the left, what you see is those are five blower door fans. So when you go to a commercial building, it's actually a lot harder to measure envelope leakage because you need a lot more flow. And the typical blower door that's used for a resident, residential application isn't enough flow to do it. And so that's that's one of the issues. In general, it, both of these procedures are relatively time intensive and rather invasive. Long story short, what happens is you'll pressurize the building to a series of different pressures, measure the flows at those pressures, and then do a fit to the equation on the right. Q is equal K delta P to the N. If you plot it on log log paper, it winds up being a, a, a linear a linear fit because uh, it's a power law. And the end result is you're able to calculate both the sort of one Pascal pressure uh, flow and what happens to that flow as you go up to higher pressures. Uh, K winds up being the leakage flow at one Pascal because delta P raised to the N, right? One raised to the N is going to be one. Uh, anyway, we don't have to have the math lesson, lesson. So the duct leakage measurement standard has not been around. Basically, the fan pressurization has been around for a long time. There have been test and balance that's done on large commercial buildings for many years. But there's recently been a new ASHRAE standard called ASHRAE standard 215, which is a way to measure duct leakage by measuring the flow going into the duct system and the flow coming out of the duct system and basically doing a subtraction. This is not a new technique, but it's finally been standardized by, by ASHRAE. Uh, what it requires you to do is to measure the flow at the fan as well as the grills. Uh, you could actually measure the flow into a branch, let's say, in a large building and not at the fan, and then all the gr grills downstream of that. Uh, but uh, well, let's just stick with looking at the fan. It is quite a bit more accurate in terms of predicting what the actual leakage flow is as opposed to the size of the holes, but it's time intensive and invasive. Uh, this is simple equation. Bessie says that the leakage is equal to the flow in uh, minus the flow coming out. So as an alternative, uh, we've come up with a MEMS or microelectromechanical system protocol, essentially using small sensors that are from other purposes to try to come up with an easier way to diagnose leakage, either envelope leakage or duct leakage in commercial buildings. So at the simplest level in this picture, what this does is this shows Q outside air, 
coming into the building. So every commercial building has an outdoor air intake on its air conditioning system. This shows a light commercial building with a simple package unit. And so you could imagine that if you measure the flow through that outdoor, outdoor air intake, and then you measure the pressure difference across the envelope of the building, you're essentially using this flow like a blower door. This is a calibrated flow. You have a measured pressure. The end result is that you can come up with the leakage measurement for the building. So this is a very simple building. Uh, in this picture, you'll notice there's no drop ceiling. It, this would be if you walked into a like a like commercial restaurant and you see all the ducks in the building. That would be the scenario here. So duck leakage isn't going to you're not going to be able to detect duck leakage, and you detect envelope leakage. So basically, if you use the sensors to measure pressure difference across the envelope and to measure the flow going in, you can come up with a leakage measurement. Okay, um, it's not progressing. I'm not sure why. I can't seem to, oh, there it is. All right. Um, all right. One thing I think is important to note is that we did not invent the wheel. So as long ago as 1973, people were using sort of the outdoor air intake to measure the leakage of a large building. And so in this picture here, this is from a, a report done by Shaw et al. Um, it was it was done sort of in a very similar way to what we're talking about, but they didn't have the level of sensors and technology, and we come up with a few things that make this a lot easier to do. Uh, one, for example, is uh, using absolute pressures instead of differential pressures to make it easier to measure pressure differentials. The basic idea for envelope leakage is if you have a one-time measurement of outdoor air inlet flow, and you have a short-term, one week or one night, pressure responses to system operations. So in other words, if you turn on the system, do you wind up seeing a change in pressure in the building? The answer is yes. If you measure that change in pressure, you can watch when the system's on, when the system is off, and use that as a way to come up with the envelope leakage. Okay, it's dragging again, I apologize. I'm trying to get it, oh, there we go. For duct leakage, it's a little bit different. So we use the pressures, but actually we use measured temperature and measured relative humidity to calculate humidity ratio or absolute humidity and essentially use it as a tracer gas for calculating flow ratios. And we'll explain how that works a little bit more. Uh, for the duct leakage, the analysis principles are essentially conservation of mass for air for the building and the ceiling plenum, and conservation of mass for water for the ceiling plenum and the return ductwork. And ultimately, all you're doing is you're mixing air streams and looking at the change in temperature or the change in humidity in those air streams and using that as a way to calculate the leakage, right? Because if you mix two air streams, you've mixed one wet air stream with a dry air stream, you get a medium wet air stream. And by the by the ratio of the measured humidities, you can calculate how much of one air stream there was versus the other, uh, where one air stream would be the leakage and the other air stream would be the normal flow. Uh, this shows just two examples of measuring the outdoor air intake. On the right, you see a super high-tech version. It's called a cardboard box. And basically, well, you take a cardboard box, put it over the inlet, and use a powered flow hood, or, or basically a, a duct blaster in this case, as a way to measure the flow in the outdoor air intake. Um, on the left, that was a sort of a simpler way, where basically we just measured the pressure drop across the outdoor air intake came up with a profile for the flow versus pressure across the outdoor intake. And then if you change the flow 
going into the building, you have a, a map, a flow map for the intake for the outdoor air coming into that unit. And this picture, it shows a slightly more complicated scenario. Now we have a ceiling and the ceiling means that I've got a pressure in the room, I've got a pressure in the ceiling, I've got a temperature and RH in the room that's going into the return duct, and then I've got a temperature and RH leaving the return duct. And if there are changes between this point and that point, that means that there must be leakage on the return side. Similarly, on the supply side, I know it's going in, I know it's coming out, that's not going to change. That's going to be exactly the same. So these two measurements in this scenario are redundant. The only reason to have them would be to see what the temperature drop is because you could have both temperature and humidity pollution of the ceiling plenum. Uh, that's, that, that's for the advanced class. Um, but long story short, what we've done is set up sensors like this and use them to calculate the leakage in some light commercial buildings and also in some large commercial buildings, which I'll get to in a little bit. One simpler scenario, and this would be the large commercial building scenario. Uh, so the, the, this is the previous slide. What you see is you see you have a return duct. In the next slide, all I did is get rid of the return duct. And now in this situation, what happens is you look at the conditions going in and the conditions leaving. You could imagine if I have any supply leakage, let's say my supply air is very dry and very cold, the dry cold air is gonna leak into the ceiling. That dry cold air is gonna mix with the air coming in from the room and I'm gonna have cooler, drier air leaving the ceiling plenum as compared to going into the ceiling plenum. That's the basic concept that we have going on here. The other thing that we did was to use absolute pressure transducers to measure differential pressures. So roughly speaking, uh, the issue of measuring pressure differences across buildings, every pressure gauge that people use is almost always a differential pressure gauge. Because when you fill up the tires in your car, you're measuring <clears throat> a pressure difference between inside the tire and outside the tire. Um, if you have a altimeter or a barometer, it measures the actual pressure of the atmosphere. So you could imagine that I'm going to measure the pressure difference, <clears throat> excuse me, between a building by measuring the absolute pressure of the atmosphere in that building compared to the absolute pressure of the atmosphere outside that building and subtracting those two. The problem is that those, those pressure differences are very small. So the atmosphere is 101,000 pascals, and the pressure difference we're measuring are on the order of, let's say, one to 50 pascals, depending on which pressure differences we're measuring. So there are obviously some challenges with this, but the sensors to do this have become very inexpensive and small, and we believe that we've come up with enough ways to manage the data analysis to be able to make use of those sensors and not have to run tubes to measure differential pressures. Okay, it's being slow again, I'm sorry, I'm not sure why we're not progressing. Oh, here we go. All right, so at this point, um, I would like to shift over and you'll hear from Armando, who is a graduate student at uh, UC Davis and is now a researcher at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. Let's see how I change how I change the I did this before. Um, I want to change who's doing the presentation. Sherry. There we go. Uh, change presenter and Give me a second. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, this is Armando Casillas talking. Uh, thank you for 
joining the webinar. So I will be going over the uh, lab testing as well as field testing uh, that we performed on UC Davis campus, which was the bulk of my thesis work. So um, uh, yeah, here we go. Uh, give me a second. All right. So the lab testing consisted of, uh, first of all, a differential pressure sensor uh, based on flow through the tube. As Mark was saying, this is the conventional measurement method for differential pressure and uh, uh, envelope leakage testing for blower door fan pressurization. Um, and what we basically did is uh, created a box where uh, we could send pressure signals um, via a math flow controller and compressor and a lab use script um, with uh, where we would give it uh, certain set points, uh, pressure set points, two Pascal, five Pascal, 10 Pascal. And we could uh, measure the pressure response with our absolute pressure sensors. So on the left picture here, you can see there's an absolute pressure sensor inserted into that steel plate. Uh, and on the right picture, you can see the uh, other absolute pressure sensor on the outside measuring pressure um, and you know sort of the ambient conditions um, of the box as well. And then the tube differential pressure sensor doing exactly the same thing on both sides. There you go, that's uh, showing you where the absolute pressure sensors are. So this is the result of one of our pressurization tests inside of the uh, wooden box. And uh, what I wanna focus on first is the orange plot, which is uh, the validine pressure sensor that we had. Uh, we use this as our ground truth sensor. Um, this is a pretty accurate um, heavy duty differential pressure sensor um, that we use as sort of the reference for both of these sensor technologies. Uh, the gray line is the differential pressure sort of conventional uh, pressure measurement tool. Um, you see that those two are, are, are pretty good in agreement in terms of what they're measuring. And the blue line is the, uh, the, the measurement given by the uh, difference in absolute pressure between those, uh, the other two sensors. Um, you, you see down on the bottom, the legend, it says A minus B post, uh, post being a uh, post subtraction of, uh, of the bias. So there is a bias uh, measurement associated with each of the absolute pressure measurements that we subtract out. And once we do that, you see that uh, the absolute pressure uh, signals are pretty comparable with the, with the other two technologies, albeit with a little more noise, which uh, we'll go over in uh, subsequent slides. So this is another test we conducted inside that same, same box. This one, however, had to do with enacting changes in temperature. Um, so we would cool down the box and heat up the box. And what you're seeing here are four different sensors inside that uh, box measuring, uh, measuring the temperature. They're all in agreement. Uh, there's a little bit of disparity between the sensors. We attribute this to uh, differences in reaction time to the conditions, um, as well as just overall inherent bias. Uh, we perform a linear correction to get these values to be a little more um, in agreement. Um, so yeah, so that's temperature. And then here we have absolute humidity, humidity ratio. So as Mark mentioned in previous slides, we use pressure, temperature, and relative humidity to uh, calculate absolute humidity with these sensors. Um, so what you're seeing here is the uh, basically the moisture level inside the uh, small box that uh, we use for testing. Um, one really cool thing you see here, and I'm not sure if you can see my uh, cursor, my mouse cursor, but uh, we insert uh, pressure signals in the box while we're cooling and heating down. And the compressor itself has pretty uh, dry air. So when we insert, uh, when we send pressure signals inside, you're getting um, drier air coming into that box. And you see these dips in absolute humidity and moisture, and which is pretty cool. It was encouraging to see that um, albeit it was a small difference in, in uh, moisture, you're picking that up with the sensors. Um, yeah, all right. So moving on to the field testing, um, this is the annual fund trailer. This is our first uh, test subject on UC Davis campus. Uh, this building is a sort of a special building. Um, it is a call center uh, where uh, UC Davis students and staff uh, cold call people and ask them for money. Um, and they have, uh, uh, the reason I bring this up is because they work sort of odd hours, 5.30 p.m. to 11 p.m. Um, so uh, that sort of creates a different scenario in terms of occupancy profiling. Um, it's not your normal eight to five uh, building. On the right here, you see a simplified diagram of the configuration of the building. So this building has a drop ceiling um, with a ducted return. This is very similar to the first scenario, Mark. Um, uh, 
addressed in the flow modeling. Um, the air flows you see here are all the possible flows that can come into the building and out of different places. So you see the, uh, the QOA being the ventilation airflow into the RTU, uh, Q supply leak, Q return leak are the, the flow streams through the uh, duct system. And depending on whether or not the room or the building itself is positively pressured to the outside, you'll be getting uh, flow going from the room to the outside, flow from the room into the ceiling plenum, as well as uh, flow going from the ceiling plenum into the outside. Uh, all right, so this is the actual configuration of the annual fund trailer. We had three identical rooftop units um, with all with their own duct system. Uh, so what we had to do is basically uh, put uh, our sensors, which measured both pressure, temperature, and relative humidity, and all of the areas you see with arrows, um, uh, and all the supply plenums, return plenums, and each area of the ceiling plenum, we measured temperature and relative humidity. Uh, we measured relative humidity and pressure inside the room, obviously, as well as on the roof to capture out their air conditions. And in addition to all of these, are sort of the, the absolute pressure sensor network we had, we also installed uh, two different under pressure sensors to use as sort of a, a reference. Um, one running tube from the inside of the building to the outside of the building, and another uh, tube differential, differential sensor uh, measuring the pressure from the room and the ceiling plenum as well. So this is the overview of the test protocol of uh, you know our MEMS protocol we call it. Uh, first and foremost, you know this. Uh, this method is IoT enabled, we say Internet of Things enabled. Uh, one of the main features of this is uh, uh, we are able to control the building remotely um, through a Wi-Fi enabled thermostat. So when we install the, uh, when we install the sensors, we're also swapping out the uh, original thermostat in the building, um, obviously with the, uh, the building manager, building owner's um, consent with our Wi-Fi enabled thermostat, which then talks to a, a, a cell gateway um, which we communicate with. Um, so the building is pressurized overnight. So our testing is being done overnight when nobody is in the building. Um, this is, you know, a way less invasive uh, method as opposed to, you know, uh, as Mark mentioned, a fan pressurization test when things are done during the day, during work hours, uh, we're able to control this um, overnight. The envelope leakage testing, uh, what we're doing is pulsing the building at known frequencies via the RTU. So we send an on signal to the RTU, five minutes on, five minutes off, 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off. Um, we're measuring the pressure in the conditioned spaces, so the room, and also as well as the unconditioned spaces, so the outdoor air uh, sort of conditions and the uh, ceiling plenum conditions as well. Um, we do some different condition uh, sort of testing. So we also re remove ceiling tiles uh, inside of the room to create a singular pressure zone to determine total leakage uh, coefficient and exponent of the building. Um, on the duct leakage side, we are monitoring the absolute humidity levels in the main air distribution areas and zones. So the ducts, ceiling, plenum, out the air conditions, as well as the room as well. Um, one caveat to the uh, duct leakage uh, testing is the signal, meaning the difference in absolute humidity, humidity ratio in the different areas needs to be great enough for us to accurately uh, calculate a leakage value. So um, one really neat thing we did is with the supply leakage testing, uh, we created a sort of sequence where uh, we put the unit in cooling and collected moisture onto the cooling coil uh, via condensation and then immediately put the unit into heating, um, which then evaporates the moisture on the coil and creates a higher absolute humidity signal. And you'll see that in some of the plots coming up. So this is a, a general plot of uh, some pressure measurements we saw and some of the areas. This is the return plenum um, of an RTU on top of the annual fund trailer. Uh, on the left, you see the little pressure sensor being stuck uh, in that little uh, the plenum there. And on the right, you're seeing uh, as a fan comes on, which is a blue line, uh, the yellow, gray, and orange line you see um, have a negative response, which is what we expect with a return plenum, which is negatively pressured. Um, all three lines have comparable magnitudes, uh, which is encouraging and just shows, uh, you know, the, the use of absolute pressure uh, sensor difference as opposed to tube differential sensor pressure difference for, uh, you know, for this type of measurement. This plot here shows the, uh, the pressure measurement of the, 
of the indoor conditions. So uh, the gray line is the, uh, the, the pressure signal inside of the building, um, which is around 3.5 pascals you see there. As the fan comes on, you see that pressure sort of uh, going up. Um, and as the fan comes on, turns off, you see the pressure going down as well. Um, the orange line is the, the plot of the uh, room in a ceiling plenum. Um, you're seeing around 0.25 pascals. That's pretty small, um, not something we would expect to pick up from the absolute pressure sensors. So it's good that we had that as well. So this graph here shows the absolute pressure uh, sensors. We're seeing about um, three pascals with this. This is a lot more noisy than what we were seeing with the other ones. However, um, when the fan comes on, we're seeing an uh, increase in absolute pressure and then a decrease in pressure when the fan goes off. All right, so this shows um, we conducted five minute pulsing testing in the building. And you see here that as uh, you see a, a few things. One thing you see is that you're seeing um, an increase in pressure as the fan kicks on and as the fan kicks off with both the tube differential pressures and the absolute pressure sensor. Um, another thing you see here is that uh, there's drift happening in uh, the absolute pressure sensor. So like a low frequency phenomenon that's happening um, that we observed when there's a difference in temperature between both sensors. So this is something that we'd like to take off uh, using some frequency based filtering. So this is the uh, bandpass filtering that we conduct here. So um, we know that the, the fan is being pressurized for five minutes and then, uh, then the fan comes off at, uh, for another five minutes. So we know that's about a 0 0.0017 hertz frequency driving frequency. So we can filter out um, noise below that frequency uh, level and above that frequency level to get this sort of comparable uh, plot you see here, which is the absolute pressure signals and the differential pressure signals, um, which uh, uh, are more comparable, less noisy, um, albeit still more noisy with absolute pressure sensors. Um, this graph here is a sort of graph I created that shows the step response when the fan kicks on and then when the fan kicks off. So what you're going to be seeing is a, a positive pressure response, positive pressure step when the fan kicks on. Um, the gray line is a lot more stable. That's the tube differential sensor. And the green line is the uh, absolute pressure uh, sensors. Um, a little more unstable, but what you're seeing here are comparable uh, step responses for both uh, sensors. With filtering and with some outlier removal, we're seeing about 0.2 Pascal difference between the tube differential sensors and the absolute pressure sensors, which is pretty pretty darn good. So then we uh, went ahead and tried to calculate the envelope leakage flow using the sensor networks. And what you're seeing here is about 1200 Pascals for the envelope leakage using the sensor networks. Um, this is assuming a value of 0 .6, 0 0.65 for the, um, for the flow exponent. Uh, this is because we're basically conducting a one point test. We don't have different pressure stations as we do with the blower door test. So uh, we assume a value of 0 0.65 here. Um, and what we do is, what we did then is then uh, conducted a blower door test to see if those values were comparable with what we collected with our sensor networks. And as you see down below on the table, we're getting about 1200 as well with the blower door test. So we're seeing pretty good agreement between the blower door test and the absolute pressure sensors, as well as the tube differential sensors, which is encouraging. This slide here shows um, the uncertainty that comes with calculating uh, standard leakage airflow. So CFM 75 is a standard commercial leakage, um, airflow leakage standard that uh, is used um, in, uh, in practice. And um, using that sort of uh, assumed exponent uh, 0 0.65, there is some certainty that goes along with that. So um, the operating pressure of our building in particular was around four or five pascals. So when you extrapolate to something like 75 pascals, there is a heightened level of uncertainty. Um, 700, plus or minus 700 CFM for our sensor network versus 22 CFM with a conventional blower door test. So this is just illustrating uh, the mixing of the airstreams that Mark was talking about. Um, I've used this slide to sort of illustrate that uh, for people who 
uh, don't necessarily know what that means. Um, so you have the supply uh, supply plenum, which is in red here, um, and then the the blue uh, blue area, which is the room. So you'll be getting mixing in the ceiling plenum, which is the purple uh, purple square here. Um, so as the room is positively pressured, it's going to be sending blue air into the ceiling plenum as well as su uh, supply leakage sending red air into the uh, ceiling plenum. The more red that area is, that, that means there's more supply leakage. The more blue that uh, that purple is, that means there's more room leakage versus supply leakage. So the, you can you can think of the colors as you sort of wet, dry air. Um, on the return side, you have air coming in from the return grill into the return plenum as well as uh, air coming in from the ceiling plenum into the uh, duct via return leakage, uh, which creates a mixing in the return plenum. So these are the general equations for both the uh, uh, phenomenon I uh, talked about in the previous slide. So you have SR, which is the supply leakage ratio, um, uh, given levels of humidity in the ceiling plenum of the room, as well as the supply plenum. And on the return side, you're getting, uh, you're measuring uh, room return plenum and ceiling plenum absolute humidities to give you a value for return leakage uh, ratio. So this is a plot of uh, the return leakage test that we conducted. This is an hour long test. Um, I wanna focus on the, uh, the orange, yellow and brown lines in the middle. Those are the absolute humidity levels in, uh, in between uh, the room and the ceiling plenum, which uh, indicates the mixing going on there. The, uh, the plots are closer to the room than they are the ceiling plenum with a bottom yellow, green, and uh, sorry, uh, blue, uh, green, and uh, lines there. So which basically indicates there's more room leakage, sorry, there's more room flow going into the return plenum as expected than there is uh, return leakage. Um, okay, talked about that. So this is the supply leakage side. Um, I mentioned we did this neat little thing where we put the unit into cooling mode to uh, condense uh, some water onto the coil and then immediately put that unit into heating mode. What that does is it evaporates uh, water uh, into the air and creates a spike in absolute humidity, which you see in the orange and green lines. Um, that gets picked up by the room as well. And then at that point, we have a sort of scenario where we can measure mixing, albeit for a very short amount of time, um, in both of those areas to come up with the supply, uh, supply ratio calculation. Um, this one's a little more shoddy. It's really hard to get those big differences in absolute humidity, um, but we were able to get a couple tests where this worked. This is just showing the general equation using conservation of mass, conservation of enthalpy principles to um, come up with uh, return leakage and supply leakage values given the measured um, the, uh, the measurements we take inside the building in supply plenum, outdoor air, ceiling plenum, and return plenum, all that. So uh, using those equations you just saw, uh, we're able to uh, calculate, de determine some return leakage and supply leakage uh, air flows at operating conditions. So this is one example as the fan kicks on and we're measuring a certain level of absolute, uh, sorry, of, uh, of return leakage here. Um, the yellow line is the, uh, is the third uh, system, which we found to be a lot more leaky than, uh, than the other two. Same thing with the supply side. Supply side ended up being a lot less leaky than the return side um, with our sensor measurements. Um, and um, we, we, what we did is we did some ground truth testing. So we did some duct, duct blaster testing in all three of the units, as well as uh, CO2 injection testing to determine airflow to come up with a, um, a value that we call a uh, percent of fan flow uh, for our return leakage and supply leakage. So what you see here are the uh, comparisons um, between the sensor network and the ground truth. Uh, total return leakage, uh, we're getting about 20% of fan flow with our sensors. Uh, we picked up 17% with our ground truth and then 11 versus 10% for supply leakage. Um, these values aren't quite there, but uh, they're pretty close. Uh, one thing um, that we did sort of pick up is there is a lot more return leakage than there is supply leakage, and we found that with our sensor networks um, and confirmed it with our ground truth testing. So uh, in summary, our findings in the Adam Fund trailer, we were able to measure envelope leakage using these inexpensive uh, sensors in a non-invasive way using the thermostat, Wi-Fi enabled thermostat to, uh, to command the, 
uh, are to use on overnight. Uh, tube sensors may still be needed uh, between building zones, as I uh, showed in one of the slides. We're getting about 0.25 Pascal difference, which is really small, in between the room and the ceiling plenum. So tube differential sensors may still need to be used in some cases. On the duct leakage side, we did demonstrate the ability to use uh, absolute humidity uh, to measure return of supply leakage. Um, supply leakage still needs some improvement. The signals we saw weren't big enough to really get a, a consistent measurement on, on that end. So this is the uh, second test building we were, uh, we conducted some testing in. Uh, this is Sprocket Annex, much smaller building, a single zone um, with a sort of oversized uh, RTU. Uh, the, uh, this is the sort of ducting that we uh, had to deal with. So this, uh, this scenario wasn't covered by Mark's uh, flow models. Um, this one's a little more complicated since you have potentially airflow um, going in from the, the, the out there air conditions into the ducts and also leaving the ducts uh, to the outside. Um, those are levels you can't really measure with absolute humidity sensors or measurements um, and makes things a lot more complicated with pressure as well. Uh, one really neat thing we did with this, however, is uh, we had an economizer on this RTU um, with uh, CO2 inputs. So what we did is we basically hacked the CO2 uh, sensor input on this economizer, um, which is used for demand control ventilation, um, and sent it different signals. So uh, overnight, we would you know, give it a you know, 2 volt, 6 volt, 8 volt, 10 volt, which uh, each, each of those indicates a certain level of concentration of CO2 in the building. What that does is it opens up that economizing damper um, uh, to sort of uh, bring in more fresh air and reduce the CO2 level. Um, these, are, these are dummy CO2 concentration levels, obviously. So what that does is it just leaves the damper open as, we, as we're testing. What this creates uh, is a, a multi-point test similar uh, to that of a blower door. So um, we're able to, with this configuration, uh, uh, create different pressure signals based on different levels of outdoor air flow. Um, so this is uh, an exciting development in this sort of uh, MEMS protocol, non-invasive testing. Um, and uh, we're still processing uh, results of that. Oh, okay, so now I'm gonna pass it over to Mark again. So you can go over some of the testing he's been doing on the side, let me see. Okay, can you hear me? I guess the organizers decided they'd had enough of me. Um, so I was <laughs> we can muted. hear you now, Mark. <laughs> okay. Um, so I was muted, so now I'm not. So basically, what I'm showing here is this is somebody else's data. So it's not data from the WCEC. Uh, There's a company called Carbon Lighthouse that goes around to buildings and monitors conditions in various places in the building and it turns out that some of the measurements they make are very close to what we would like to see measured in order to make our tests that we're talking about here so this is a the simplest case building in which case what you have is you have a ceiling plenum return and what i've shown here and i could see armando so i assume you could see mine this is in this case we're just looking at temperature so this is the temperature of the air in a supply grill. This is the temperature of the air leaving the room. And this is the temperature of the air leaving. And in this case, it wasn't right at the exit of the floor. So we don't know exactly what's going on. But, um, but the idea is leave, going into the return plenum. And so if you have mixing of this air with that air, you wind up with a something that's going to be in between. So that, so in this case, 
It's just using temperature. Now, the problems with temperature are that there are multiple things that can impact temperature, say like lights uh, would impact the temperature. But cold, leakage of cold air from the ducts into the ceiling plenum would make the air colder. On the other hand, conduction of air, uh, conduction from the ceiling plenum into the supply duct would also make the ceiling plenum cooler. And so you, you're seeing both effects. That was the one reason, as I mentioned earlier, that you could conceivably, and we've not really played with this yet, conceivably look at the change in temperature for the supply air to have some estimate of how much of the cooling was created by, by the supply air, uh, excuse me, by conduction rather than by leakage. All right, now, trying this again, there we go. So normal operation shows the ceiling plenum exit temperature between the room and the supply ducts. So I supply plenum exit and room temperature provide an indication of supply duct leakage. Notice I wrote indication because it's kind of hard to know what else is going on thermally. However, if you just took those numbers that you see on the screen, it would estimate the supply leakage to be 25%. Now, what we're looking at is instead of the temperatures, we're looking at the humidity ratio. And in this case, we're looking at the average in the space, the average of the return air, and one of the grills, the supply air grills. So what you see is that the supply air grill is during this period, it's drier than the air in the room, and that the air in the, leaving the ceiling plenum, in this case, it's not exactly leaving the ceiling plenum, it's a good bit away, it's back up in the, in the main air handling room, but it's in between the two. And then what you see here is that the supply became wetter than the room, but once again, the return is in between the two. So just to remind everybody, what you're supposed to see if you had no leakage is that the red line should be exactly on top of the black line. If you're mixing some of this airstream with that airstream, you produce a new airstream and a new humidity level. So normal operation shows ceiling plenum exit humidity between the room and the supply duct. This is not that different from what you've heard before. Um, and the supply and the plenum exit provide, uh, I see, in this case, I said a determination of percent supply duct leakage. However, as you can see, the number here looks rather high. 74% leakage doesn't quite pass the laugh test. Um, but the issue, in my opinion, is that we are looking at very small signals here. Uh, another, in the scenarios that Armando was talking about, we had much larger absolute humidity differences. In this case, the absolute humidity differences are quite small. So we've done some signal to noise analysis and we have a pretty good idea as to when you're gonna get sort of very good answers and when you're gonna get kind of noisy answers. And I think this, is, this one is on the, on the side of too noisy. Okay, come on and click. So, but what we did do is we went to the building and inside I explained uh, ASHRAE standard 215 has a leakage test method where you measure the flows going in, the flows going out. But there's an appendix to the standard where you don't have to turn off the system fan and you can just measure leakage downstream of VAV boxes. What you do is you hook up a duct blast or a fan pressurization system to one grill and then you block the other grills and you turn the VAV box damper to a minimum position and then you run through a bunch of tests. I'm not going to describe all that now. It's a little late in the process for that, but you're going to trust me a little bit and basically with this methodology, we tested downstream of two VAV boxes 
and we came up with one of the boxes was 12% and the other box was 30% leakage downstream of the VAV box. So this doesn't include any leakage upstream of the VAV boxes on that floor. So it provides sort of a minimum level of leakage that you've got there. So long story short, this is not exactly ground truth testing, but what it was, was going into a very large building. I think it was a 48 story building in downtown LA. And we were able to pull out, pull out results that were wound up being consistent and they could then make a decision as to whether or not it's worth sealing the leaks in that building. Um, it's one other sort of aside I'll throw out here relative to this. And that is there was, I got another set of data from them, but it was from Maryland. And the data from Maryland, it suggested really high leakage fractions. And it just, uh, both with temperature and with uh, humidity. And the signal to noise was fine. So it, I was very confused as to what was going on. And then I had a little bit of an aha insight moment, which is that the outside air was really cold and really dry. And so what was happening, I believe, is that when the, the, the ceiling plenum return, when the fan is running, it's running at a negative pressure relative to outside. And it's sucking in not just air from the room, but air from outside. So leakage of cold, dry air from outside looks just like leakage of cold, dry air from a supply duct. And so the end result is you have a mixture of the two, which is why for this building, we didn't have any pressure measurements were not required. But I think moving forward, we'd want to have pressure measurements between inside and outside. And therefore, you'll be able to see what happens. Well, A, a you've got a pressure measurement that tells you you're running negative relative to outside. And B, by looking at what kind of humidity and temperature differences you get when you're doing it at outdoor conditions that are very similar to indoor versus outdoor conditions that are very different from outdoor, basically during the night, during the day kind of things, you should see changes in that leakage percentage. So we're not quite there yet, but this is one of the places we're looking at going. So in terms of conclusions, I would say that proof of concept, that a non-invasive men's protocol could be used to estimate building a duct leakage. I think we've got there. We haven't got, I would say that's not a working product and it's a slam dunk, but it, it's very encouraging from my perspective. Absolute pressure difference measurements serve great potential as, a differ as an alternative to differential pressure sensors with tubes. Um, since doing this work, we've done some more work in our lab and the manufacturer of the, of the sensors that we're using, which is XC-SPEC, they've been, modifying their sensors and we've got new data and the new sensor, the, the new sensors are performing better than the previous ones in terms of stability. They're not showing long-term drift. And if you don't show long-term drift, that makes the need for that bandpass filter that, that Armando talked about, uh, makes the need for that less important. And so that, that's also a very encouraging result. Um, I think it's worth noting that different building configurations present unique challenges. What we're doing right now is we're gonna go out to 10 or 15 buildings at uh, the Miramar Air Force Base in, uh, in San Diego. And uh, that's funded by DOD to try it on a bunch of different kinds of buildings. And that, that's just getting, we're just getting sort of set up to, to go out in the field right now. The signal to noise for the absolute humidity tracer gas needs some further testing. I mean, as you showed you, the results came out to be not that believable in that one building. Um, in general, uh, we need to develop a spec for how much of a differential you need to make this viable. Um, and then finally, uh, the protocol is still in its, I'd say, nascent stages, but it shows, I think, good potential. And so at this point, um, we would be happy to answer any questions. Let's see how we're doing. Three minutes, we have three minutes of questions. Well, we can go longer if anybody wants to stay. Excellent, thanks, Mark. Yeah, um, so we do have a, 
one question to start with uh, from Brett. Um, could this be applied to residential uh, applications or is that, that necessary? I guess we'll go with Mark on this. Well, I, many, many years ago, I had a test called a house pressure test. This is, we're going back like 15, 20 years. And actually SMUD had contractors go out and do that house pressure test. And they were able to diagnose to a reasonable level whether or not a given house required duct sealing in that house. So the short answer is, I, I believe with the, new, the newer technologies, it'll be much easier and cheaper to do, uh, but someone would have to put together the protocol for single family houses Probably, it probably be similar to what I was doing way back when, um, but I think it would become cheaper and easier to do at this point with the new sensors. We, at the time, we were only looking at duct leakage. We could also try to look at envelope leakage. The issue with envelope leakage, trying to do envelope leakage this way in single family residential, is they don't have an outdoor, most systems do not have an outdoor air intake on their on their uh, HVAC equipment. One could conceivably do a, some sort of a flow estimation or measurement mm -hmm. on a kitchen exhaust fan or a bathroom exhaust fan, and then measure the pressure differences created by that. It, that's a little hokey. I haven't really <laughs> thought, that, thought that through, but for the duct leakage, I, it's, I think it's easy to transfer. For the envelope leakage, we'd have to think about it a little bit more. Okay, great. Um, any other questions um, from our audience? I'll, I'll give you guys a few minutes to think of some things.